So as always, let's first start with SpaceX's Starship Asset 9. So when can we finally see the next flight? Then in other cool news, SpaceX bought two freaking oil rigs for their future Starship Super Heavy launches from sea. And then Jim Bridenstine has stepped down as NASA administrator, Steve Jertzik taking over his role until a permanent administrator will be appointed by the Biden administration. Talking of Joe Biden, we are pleasantly surprised that he wanted to have a moon rock in the Oval Office. That might be a good omen for the Artemis program, we hope. And on that topic, NASA has released results of why the SLS engines shut down prematurely on the Green Run Hot Fair test. Then in some totally unrelated news, which we cannot ignore, because we like Titan so much. Turns out, Kraken Mary on Titan could be more than 300 meters deep. Wowzer! A lot to talk about again, so stay tuned. So we have some really good news. The Starship S9 prototype has finally completed a good static fire test on Saturday, January 23rd. Like a good one, not a too short one. With all three engines firing up. Everything looked quite nominal on this very cool recordings here by the amazing lab padre. Please go and check out his channel because his work is invaluable to the space community. Link to his channel in the description. Also, it seems that this time the engines haven't been damaged and don't need to be replaced. Which is really good because this in turn means what? Well, we all know what this means, namely that the way is free now for a high altitude test flight of SN9. Sorry the hardcore Starship fans, we of course know that you know this already, but let's try to figure out together when the flight might actually happen. So Elon said on Twitter on the very same day of the successful static fire test, that hopefully early next week the test flight will take place. So this means early this week of course. So basically today or tomorrow should qualify as early this week. Then in addition we have some NOTAMs, which stands for Notice to Airmen. Wait what? How non-inclusive! <laughs> but don't worry, we are sure the PC police will soon force us to say no tax. Anyways, a few NOTAMs have been published by the good old FAA. This one here closing the airspace on Monday the 25th from 2 p.m. until midnight. This one the same for Tuesday the 26th. And this one here for Wednesday the 27th. So this is already a very good indicator since a closed airspace around SpaceX's Boca Chica facility means that something big will be flying up to the altitude where normally passenger airplanes fly, so up to 12 kilometers of altitude. So yes, Starship SN9 could indeed fly today with a bit of luck, but if not, then on Tuesday or on Wednesday. So yes, it shouldn't be long now anymore until we can finally see another high altitude test flight with a Starship prototype. In some other really cool and still SpaceX related news, we were often wondering how exactly does SpaceX actually want to do the super heavy sea launches? Will they build larger drone ships? Will they retrofit some oil tankers or rigs? Well, now we know. Because last week, reports were suddenly surfacing that SpaceX bought two old oil rigs. And since we all know that the age of oil is coming to an end, no less thanks to Elon's efforts on the Tesla front, these two rigs won't have a lot to do. Therefore, why not use them to launch super heavy? The coolest thing is that SpaceX calls them Deimos and Phobos. You know, like the two small moons of Mars. And since Starship has the goal of Mars, these names are of course quite fitting. On the other hand, Deimos and Phobos come from Greek and have the meaning of terror or dread and panic, respectively. Let's hope that people won't encounter these feelings when boarding the rigs in the future en route to Mars. Now of course, in order to get from here to here, quite some refitting work will be needed. But if someone can do this, then SpaceX. And please subscribe to our channel, because we not only report on the latest spaceflight news, but also all other kinds of disruptive technologies. However, the YouTube algorithm doesn't like it when our channel covers too many different topics. So we really need your support to keep making these videos. Thanks a lot in advance. Apart from SpaceX, we have some other pretty cool developments. 
only a few days in office and Joe Biden already positively surprised us by having a moon rock ordered from NASA as a quote, symbolic recognition of earlier generations, end quote, ambitions. The moon rock itself was collected by Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt in 1972 in Taurus Litroff Valley on Apollo 17, the last Apollo moon mission. This might bode quite well for NASA's Artemis program, the sister program of Apollo, so to speak, which aims to return humans to the moon in this decade. Now we say in this decade on purpose, because we think that the 2024 moon return date cannot be upheld, given the current funding of NASA. And we have already speculated that a Biden administration would mean a likely delay of the Artemis 3 manned moon landing to somewhere between 2026 and 2028. Anyways, hopefully Joe Biden surprises us all with an ambitious moon return timeline, but let's see. Regarding NASA, he appointed Steven Jertzik as acting NASA administrator. Jertzik was previously associate administrator which is the third highest position of NASA, after the administrator which had been Jim Bridenstine until January 20th, and after the deputy administrator, who also left NASA on the 20th. Jertik will be NASA administrator until the final administrator of the new administration will be decided at some point later this year. Let's see who it will be. But we shouldn't forget that Jim Bridenstine was a positive surprise, and that when he took on his role, he was a bit of a controversial figure due to his previous stance on climate change. However, he quickly won everyone over with his relentless pushing for support of Artemis on both sides of the political spectrum. Since he started as administrator in April 2018, we have seen so much happen at NASA and for the first time in decades, we had real hope for a return to the moon. And actually this time, it was looking better than ever since the days of Apollo in large part due to his work. So we really have to thank Jim Bridenstein, because NASA is now stronger than it has been in a very long time. And we really hope that the next NASA administrator will also be a pleasant surprise, and he or she will carry on the legacy of Jim Bridenstein. And we all know that current plans foresee humans returning to the moon with NASA's SLS rocket. We remember that on January 16th, NASA conducted a green run hot fire test of the SLS core stage at the Stennis Space Center. The test was supposed to last for at least 250 seconds, but unfortunately, after only 67 seconds, an abort sequence was initiated, which led to a premature shutdown of the test. NASA said they would be investigating the cause of this premature shutdown, and only three days later, NASA revealed in a blog post update that the SLS core stage is in good condition and that the engines shut down because the testing parameters were too conservative, and not because there had been an engine malfunction. According to NASA, it was engine 2 that caused the abort. So while the engines were performing a gimballing test, the core stage auxiliary power unit for engine 2 exceeded preset test limit, and the computer system automatically shut down the test as it was designed to do. However, NASA said it wouldn't have been a problem during a real launch. The actuators in the thrust vector control system that generate the force to gimbal an engine are powered by those hydraulic CAPUs. NASA writes further, quote, the specific logic that stopped the test is unique to the ground test when the core stage is mounted in the B2 test stand at Stennis. If this scenario occurred during a flight, the rocket would have continued to fly using the remaining CAPUs to power the thrust vector control system for the engines. Now the question of course is whether the test needs to be repeated or not. If the test has to be repeated, this might delay the launch of Artemis 1 which is of course not so good. But then again, being on the safe side for that launch also wouldn't hurt. So let's see how NASA will decide. And now suddenly a totally different topic, namely new interesting data from the Cassini probe, which orbited Saturn and performed many flybys of Saturn's moons in the period from 2004 until 2017, when it was deliberately destroyed by diving into Saturn's atmosphere. 
But before that, in one of the late flybys, Cassini gathered some really fascinating data on the liquid hydrocarbon lakes of Saturn's largest moon Titan. The second largest moon in the solar system, larger than the planet Mercury and the only moon in the solar system to have a dense atmosphere. Oh, and the only moon or planet in the solar system outside of Earth to have large lakes of liquid on the surface. But they aren't made of water, of course, but made of liquid methane and ethane, which are liquid at the very low temperatures present on Titan, namely minus 179.6 degrees Celsius or 93.6 degrees Kelvin on average. The largest one of those seas is Kraken Mara, which is as large as all of the North American lakes combined. Not bad, so it's quite large. But how deep is it? Until recently, we could only speculate. But now data of the Cassini probe from one of the last flybys was analyzed by scientists at Cornell University. And it turns out that these seas can be really deep, namely in some places more than 300 meters or 1,000 feet deep. These are quite impressive depths. With this new knowledge, sonars of potential future subsea exploration probes could be calibrated more precisely and to better understand the sea's directional flows. There is already a proposed mission for such an autonomous robotic exploration submarine, which would dive around the seas of Titan, powered by a fission-powered thermoelectric power source. But of course, if funded, we could see this mission launched in 2030 earliest. So don't get your hopes up too high to see it happen soon. Well, with any luck, starships might be there sooner, and then humans can finally explore this fascinating moon. And if you are more interested in Mars, you can watch this video here, where we talk about the most economical way how we could colonize the red planet. So thanks for watching the GI Spence Report, and I would say, on to the future. I mean, it took you only 30 minutes to record everything, it will take me at least 90 minutes. Okay, how is this guy called? Stefan Jurzik. And Joe Biden already is... God. <laughs>